Good morning. It's a lovely sunny Sunday morning and I thought we'd go on a nice trip to Sandown on the Isle of Wight. I did say that uh, the Isle of Wight is one of my favourite uh, trips and when you've got all day as we have today we can afford to um, indulge ourselves a bit. Flying, private flying sometimes can be a bit of a rush to get down to the airfield, get half an hour's flying in and then get down before it gets dark and, and get home again. But uh, it's Sunday, and that's traditionally the day for a decent fly. So what we're going to do is use the flight planner today. So let's uh, get cracking on. The airport we're going to start from is Manston, and uh, we'll start from any small gate. It usually puts you somewhere right out of the way. The um, airport we're going to is Sandown. So if I... You can put any um, airport in here that's in the database and that's Hotel November. So double click on that and that's selected. We're going to be going down using visual flight rules. In other words, we'll uh, just be flying clear of cloud inside of the surface. And we'll go down VOR to VOR and find the route. Uh, now, let me just zoom in a bit on this. I like zooming in on this because on, on the original uh, and early flight sims, zooming took, I mean, you could go and make a cup of tea while you zoomed in. Now it's instant. Uh, it's, this, is, this is so much the program that it was always supposed to be, but never was. Um, it's still a little bit small, but um, at least it's much, much quicker. Now here we've got the Gatwick control zone, Echo Golf Kilo Kilo. Um, and we want to skirt around that. So... What it's done is it's taken us to the first VOR, which is Detling, and the second one, which is at Goodwood, which is, in fact, it will give you the frequency here, 11475. And you can see it's a VOR stroke DME, which means that we're going to get distance measuring uh, information from it as well. And I think um, Detling is the same, uh, if I can just find the right spot to hover over it. Anyway. I know Detling's, there we are, Detling's 117.3, and it's also going to give us DME, which is marvellous. It's not all the VORs do. Now, can we drag that to Maypole? My goodness, yes, we can. So if we select May, sorry, Mayfield, um, Maypole is a local airfield here. Um, and Mayfield, we've got 117.9, and once again, it's a VOR DME. So you can't drag this map. You have to put the thing in the corner here. And it doesn't show it very well, but um, Sandown is actually on an island. It's actually on the Isle of Wight. So, but there's no other airspace. This is the Southampton airspace, so we're fine. And the cruising altitude, well, we're going to be going past Gatwick, so we can't really cruise at 4,500 feet. I think the most we're going to be able to cruise at is 1,500 feet past Gatwick. Um, you can obviously determine that on a real-world map if you want to, but um, I'm going to put 1,500 feet um, because that's... We, we could go all the way at 1500. We, we'll climb. When we can, we'll climb higher. So let's um, save that. And it will give it a sensible name. That's fine. And then that's our nav log. And it's telling us we need 25 gallons of fuel. Not very clear, is it? It says gallons stroke pounds. I think 25 pounds wouldn't be enough. Um, <clears throat> sorry, no, the estimated fuel burn here, here we are, 10 gallons, 60, 60 pounds, because it's, it's 107 miles, and it's about an hour, so we'll probably split this over two videos. So I'm not going to print it, because I think I can get this up on the knee board, so um, I think we're, all, we're okay there, so we'll just click OK, and it's going to ask if I want to move my aircraft to Echo Golf Mike Hotel, um, to that particular gate, and I'll say yes, because I don't know where else we're going to end up. It was 9.46, and I think the weather's pretty nice. As far as um, fuel and payload goes, we always display the fuel quantity as a weight because we're not interested really in uh, how many gallons we've got. We're interested in how much weight we've got. And uh, if we look at the fuel, we can see we've got pretty well, we're half full, 75 pounds in each tank. Now, that's, that would, that's fine. That's enough. That's enough to get there and back. I'm going to do what most pilots would do, which is fill it up, which is extremely wasteful because we're carrying around fuel. We'll be carrying fuel there and we'll be ferrying it back and landing with it. But, you know, peace of mind is, is worth something, isn't it? 
left, right, and that's it. So off we go. And we're on the apron at Manston. So let's just have a little look around. I think they've put us in the usual light aircraft spot, which is uh, not, not near anywhere. I did find a way of getting rid of this. If you press, um, I think, Shift-1, you can get rid of that. So um, you still have to um, go through the... Uh, I don't know why all these are on, because this is all... This is a cold, should be a cold and dark startup. Let's uh, remember to give it some fuel, and then we'll put the ignition onto both. And off we go. Shift A twice. And we want that one. We want that one. And that one. So we want the second, the fourth and the fifth. We'll have to remember that. Two, four, five. Now in the tower they should have seen our beacon come on. So I'm not going to do the um, air traffic control, the, the, the flight simulator air traffic control for this because um, it can get a little bit irritating. But uh, we, will, we will do other flights with it on. It's a good system. I, I like it. It's not accurate, but, uh, you know, it certainly uh, it adds an extra layer of challenge to um, comply with the directions it gives and, and also to know when the directions it's giving are totally ridiculous and when to turn it off. So we'll, we'll call up uh, Manson Tower and say uh, Manson Tower Golf Alpha, Bravo Alpha Foxtrot Mike 2 on board, request radio check and taxi for departure. They'll come back with something like uh, Golf Bravo Alpha Foxtrot Mike reading you 5, taxi holding point 28. So we read that back and then we're clear to go. And I'm going to turn this on the rudder so I'm going to do it very slowly because the last thing we want to do is clip one of those uh, vehicles with the left wing. I think we're all clear. There we are, and off we go. If I remember correctly, I don't think they use this part of the apron at all. Everything uh, we, we would really um, be parked over over there by the um, passenger terminal. That's one of the big buzzes you get when you fly, is um, having an airside pass and walking through. In, in, the, in the case of uh, Manston, you have to walk through the passenger terminal. And at the back there's a door marked um, pilots only, and you just walk straight through. And just the other side of the door is customs. And um, because you've got an airside pass, you just walk straight through and... Uh, and straight out on the apron and then on the apron are <laughs> is probably the jumbo jet and your Cessna 152 <laughs> now I'm just having a quick look at the gauges the um, turn coordinator seems to be behaving itself the direction indicator and the compass seem to be doing what they should be doing. I know uh, people think I'm probably taxiing around crazily but in fact I'm checking the instruments. That's my excuse anyway. Now the first VOR we're going to is um, Detling Hill isn't it? So that's 117.3 so using the keyboard method of setting we're going to just press N we're already on 117 so we just want to set the lower digits so you press NN you won't find that in any uh, you only get that on this video that you won't find that anywhere else and you press plus plus and by the, the plus I'm talking about the plus and minus on the keyboard not not on the numeric keypad but the actual ones that are next to the backspace on the keyboard so that's uh, set that and the key to make that active is X. If you press X it swaps over the inactive display with the active display. Right, well, we're at the Delta hold um, which I think will taxi to the Charlie hold so I'm going to turn left on Alpha 
and just go down to the Charlie Hold. We'll give ourselves a little bit more runway. I mean, this thing will, as I say, will probably take off in the width of the runway, but um, there's no point getting ourselves. Uh, why, why, why add a potential problem to the, the long list of potential problems we've already got when you fly? <laughs> Now the near board I think is shift F10. There we are, look at that, that's marvellous. So if we look at the briefing, nothing, messages nothing. Checklist, well checklist um, Where's that one? This must be the only one I haven't pressed, that's it, navlog. Uh, let's just enlarge that a bit. So after Detling the 117 decimal 3 we're going to fly to Mayfield aren't we which is 117 decimal 9 so there's no reason why you shouldn't set that up now actually so if I press N and then plus 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 N N plus 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 now I'm tuned into both and uh, when we've arrived at Detling and we want to go to Mayfield we can just press X and it will instantly well there we go. instantly instantly swap us over to the uh, to the new frequency now why am I taxing past Charlie you ask well the answer is we've got to just do in 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 to win checks so Ideally, the wind you can see from the windsock they will be will be flying down the, will be uh, blowing down the runway. So let's just turn the knee board off for a second and put the parking brakes on and just check everything's clean and the mixture's lean and we put the throttle up to something that's not going to cause us to take off. 1700 now you can um, select the magnetos with the keyboard if you just press M and then go minus minus it will turn turn you down take you down to the let the right hand magneto and then plus plus onto both and then minus onto left and plus onto both so if you're not confident about doing that with the mouse and it is a bit fiddly with the mouse then you can do that and we're looking we're looking at the temperatures and pressures and it's really noisy in the plane and all the passengers are thinking oh my what have I got myself into here but we're you know, running the engine at pretty well full tilt on the ground is a bit uh, disconcerting, but you want to just make sure, take your time, make sure everything's working fine. Fuel is full up, that's great. Everything else is looking fine. So the engine, the engine itself is looking pretty fine. So then what we'll do, we'll just pull back on the throttle right the way back and just check we don't get a stall, an engine stall, as opposed to a wing stall, which is, which is different. So parking brakes off and we say, um, Golf Foxtrot Mike ready for departure. So we've been clear for takeoff runway 28. And the winds are westerly. Remember what I said about if you want to find out the winds in extremis, just press Shift Z and they'll give you the winds 231 at 8. So we'll have been clear to take off runway 28, winds 231 at 8. I'm going to press B just to um, set the regional pressure setting, which you will have been given as well. Not sure nothing's coming in. And um, when I straighten up on the runway, I'll press D to set the DI. You don't want to hang around on the runway, obviously. Runway real estate is uh, pretty uh, protectively guarded. Right. 10 degrees of flaps and off we go well we're thinking of taking off aren't we we don't have to take off at this stage stopping it turning left and stopping it 
climbing too fast. Build up some speed, that's it. Right, we could probably still land from here if we needed to. Let's get those flaps up. And now we're going to start climbing because it looks like everything's fine. Now let's just um, swap these back because we're going to 117 decimal 3 and we need to have some sort of uh, clue where to fly don't we I know it's going to be west so we'll make sure the triangle is pointing upwards and just keep going round until there we are there we are and it pretty well is west so in fact We've turned uh, south a bit, we didn't need to. Keep adjusting that, because till we find a radial we like. That looks like a nice one. Now we're still monitoring the engine temperatures and pressures. I haven't enabled failures on here. I'm going to enable failures on the plane at some point. So it'll give us something to watch out for. And no plane is ever 100% perfect, is it? Although I'm pleased to say I've never really had a what I call a major failure. Now as we do our um, attitude power trim level off, you'll notice that um, obviously the plane speeds up. Now as the plane speeds up the wing becomes more efficient. And as the wing becomes more efficient the plane tries to climb more. So in fact uh, while initially leveling off is quite easy subsequently as you level off and speed up the plane will, will fight you and it will try to climb again so you have to even try even harder to level off. And this is just a, a technique, you'll get the hang of this. You tend to learn what the, uh, the, the way, you know, how a, how a plane flies. Somebody once uh, well, that was last week, actually. They just once asked me. They asked me last week. I said, how does a plane fly? Which is fine. If you don't know, you should ask, shouldn't you? I was tempted to say, well, the wings. It's got wings. But, um, that's Whistle over the right there. That's where I live. I'm determined to show you my house one day. When we come back, Perhaps we'll go over. No, actually, you, you probably we, we go over it more when we fly over Sheerness there to the right. That's the island you can see, and uh, more more to the north. Perhaps we'll go over it when we we go to Tharak or come back from Tharak. But no, a plane technically a plane flies because it's got a, a high pressure area under the wing and a low pressure area above the wing. And so what that means is that obviously the wing generates lift. The, the higher pressure area pushes the wing up into the low pressure area. Now, when I was trained, it was thought that it was very much to do with the shape of the wing. And the wing is flat on the bottom, simplifying things slightly, but it's pretty much flat on the bottom and it's curved on the top. So what happens is when the air arrives at the front of the wing edge the top half splits off and goes over the top bottom half goes down the, the bottom half obviously goes straight past because it's flat but the top half has to go further it has to go round round the curve and because it has to go further it has to sort of stretch itself out more so it loses pressure so there's a 
it develops like a pressure differential between the um, the top and the bottom and it was thought that that's the, it was the pressure differential due to the shape of the wing that just that kept the plane up in the air now these days we tend to think it's there is a component of that but it's far more to do with just the angle of the wing and that's very similar to if you're driving a car and you put the window down and you put your hand out I wouldn't recommend doing this if you're driving but if you're a young child in the back you can do it, you probably have done um, then um, if you put your hand out the window and angle your hand you can you can cause your hand to go up and down can't you just from the wind pressure and the faster you're going uh, the more the effect and so that's that's how we think planes really fly what happens is the propeller drags the wing forward through the air and the wing being angled against the uh, the air current just lifts the plane by the pressure of the uh, on rushing air on the bottom edge I don't care as long as it works one or the other but that explains why um, why as I say when you level off and you speed up the plane starts to climb even more it starts to climb more efficiently because as you go faster it develops more lift and the other thing you have to remember is of course that uh, when it goes slower it develops less lift so just keep that in mind as well now we're pretty well set up here I'm flying this manually we're, we're at 2000 feet which is where we need to be and we've got Detling tuned in and we're we're on the uh, something like the 268 radial and we're steering pretty much 268 now why aren't we steering exactly 268 well the answer is the wind obviously we've got a slight wind from the left and so we're having to steer slightly into the wind to go to track 268 along the ground and that's quite normal you'll fly on some days which don't have any wind um, in which case you won't need to bother but, um, you just um, look at where you're supposed to be flying you can fly it if it goes wrong turn whichever ways you need to turn to correct it and then just maintain a slight correction on now remember I said about the DME so here we've got on the DME box we've got the distance to Detling so we've got 16.8 16.7 miles to go and over the ground we're doing 99 knots or relative to Detling we're doing 99 knots relative to Detling that is important you can see on the airspeed indicator here we're indicating 110 knots through the air but we're only doing 100 knots over the ground so that tells us that we've got a 10 knot headwind that doesn't mean that the wind is blowing directly onto our head at 10 it just means that it's blowing and, and that part of it which is pushing us back is 10 knots it might be pushing us sideways 5 knots and back 10 knots so it could be could be a 13, 14, 15 knot wind from a, from a funny angle but the headwind component of it is 10 knots now I say it's giving our speed to Detling because if you think about it we're flying directly to Detling so in fact it is giving us our ground speed because it's we're measuring the speed relative to a point on the ground that we're actually flying straight to but supposing we weren't flying straight to Detling, supposing we were just flying past it, supposing we were not going to get closer than five miles to it, then then that would still give us our speed relative to Detling, but it wouldn't give us our ground speed. Because if you can imagine your speed relative to something that you're driving past and not really going to or from will be different. For that sort of that sort of uh, scenario, what will happen is that as if you're quite a way away it will give you pretty close to your ground speed but then as you get closer and the thing starts to drift by on the right hand side that speed will drop off to zero because when you go past it at one point you'll have zero speed relative to it because you'll just be it'll just be a beam the side of the plane so you will not you won't be getting any closer or any further away from it it'll just be drifting past so your speed then will drop to zero and then as you get further away from it it will um, go back up to something approaching a ground speed now 
there's a town down there. What is that? I think that is Sittingbourne. Could be. Or it could be Faversham. Never really here. Uh, I think it's Faversham. Yes, it is, because it's Faversham Creek, look. We're certainly putting on altitude. Let's just uh, go down a bit. Let's keep on to keep it at 2,000 feet, if I can. Yes, because that's Faversham Creek. You see all those boats uh, in the mud? And it is mud, I'll tell you. I went sailing there once with a bloke. He said to me, come sailing. I'd taken him flying. He said to me, come sailing. So we went along. There's so much mud in Faversham Creek, right? If you if you moor your boat there, and then you said park, if you moor your boat there, you have to go at high tide to get the boat out. I'm not joking. It's like there's literally five minutes when there's enough water over the mud to get the boat going. <laughs> so we spent two hours um, getting it seaworthy. I well, thought seaworthy. And then um, he said, get in, get in. So we got in and he pushed off and we drifted out. We drifted out into the middle of the creek. And we stayed there because there was no wind and he didn't have a boat or, he didn't have a motor or anything on it it's just a... this is Detling Hill coming up you can I mean you might be able to see that the uh, it's getting a little bit hilly so this is a this is what passes for high ground in Kent yeah so we sat there in the middle of Faversham Creek for about two hours <laughs> We must have moved 300 yards uh, at the most. That actually probably, that is a gross overestimate. Now you'll notice that the um, the VOR is getting pretty jumpy now. I'm I'm trying to fly it accurately. I'm actually not doing a very good job of flying it accurately because I'm trying to do that and talk and think at the same time, which is, as a man, a bad idea. So we don't multitask, apparently. But um, yeah, they are. So I'm, so I'm flying the radio, but we're about eight miles away from it now. So I'm going to show it to you if I can. It's situated on the Detling, or the Kent County showground, which is where we used to have. Well, I think we still do have uh, the old agricultural fair, but um, mostly it's um, Christmas bazaars and things now. Whenever I used to go there, I used to park the car near the VOR because then I would always find my way back. Not because I radio navigated back to the car, I know that's what you're thinking. But because I, um, you could just um, see it from miles away, so it was always a smart, you know, there's so many thousands of cars there. 